Good afternoon. Thanks very much for joining us for this live and interactive webinar today. Um, so I guess uh, we've just wanted to kick off this one uh, to understand for all the, uh, the people joining us today, uh, wherever you're dialing in from, are you in lockdown or not? Uh, certainly we, we are, some of us in the team here uh, joining us today are. Um, and, you know, we'd like to sort of get your, your views on um, uh, what your predicament is. So are you joining us from uh, your dining room, your bedroom, your bathroom, maybe somewhere else? Um, yeah, really delighted to have you today uh, in, in this webinar uh, where we, we will try and uh, cover quite a broad um, uh, number of topics. Uh, and today's topic of the day, of course, is modernizing train control systems, a journey towards automation and beyond. So quite a deep topic, uh, uh, certainly a topic for all of us, us uh, located in Australia and New Zealand, very close to our hearts. So there's a lot of um, a lot of things happening in the industry at the moment, and we're sort of very excited to talk about uh, some of those key themes and um, and topics of a discussion. So maybe first uh, first first. Um, a uh, few points that I wanted to run through. So my name is Alan Trestor. Uh, very pleased to host and moderate uh, this discussion today uh, throughout this live and interactive webinar. Uh, first, uh, first things first. Uh, please, uh, I'll ask you to use the chat box uh, to post your questions. We want to make this session as interactive of, uh, as possible uh, with our panel of experts. Uh, we want to delve into some of the key topics that you're interested to discuss with us. Um, Second point I think uh, really important is the, the webinar will be recorded. It's currently uh, recording live. Uh, and also another interesting uh, aspect is if you feel that uh, you won't have the time to cover the entire webinar, uh, you will have access to a replay after this webinar is complete and it'll be lodged into uh, our website. So um, delighted to welcome today uh, our panel of experts. Uh, but before that, just a quick uh, important uh, uh, welcome to country and acknowledgement to country. Uh, really important us, for us to acknowledge. Uh, and so I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners and custodians of the land, uh, wherever you're joining us from today, uh, and their elders, uh, past, present, and future. Uh, I think uh, we, we certainly value uh, that uh, at, at Sistra. Uh, what I would like to do next is uh, is probably introduce our, our panel of experts. Uh, so I'll start with uh, the right hand side here, uh, Virginie Raoult. Uh, welcome, Virginie. Uh, Virginie is is based uh, based out of Paris and joining us live from Paris today. Um, Virginie's uh, has got a broad uh, area of capability, 15 years uh, of experience with Sistra. Um, she's worked on extensive metro lines in the United States, uh, Chile, Mexico, Buenos Aires, and also more recently, uh, Grand Paris in Paris, uh, as well as uh, being involved in some of the mod modernization activities in the UK. Uh, so broad uh, range of capability in uh, ETCS uh, and CBTC. Um, Second member of the panel, uh, Pierre-Henri Marinet. Uh, Pierre-Henri, uh, good afternoon. Um, Pierre-Henri has got 20 years of experience uh, broadly in technical and engineering delivery, uh, uh, having spent extensive time uh, working for train control OEMs and, and also a number of years covering client side topics, whether it's strategic business case uh, or even uh, technical reviews. Uh, and Pierre-Henri uh, has over 10 years experience and knows broadly the Australian New Zealand market. So we'll be able to touch on uh, those issues uh, that concern you directly. Um, Daniele, welcome. Uh, Daniele uh, joins us from uh, Singapore today, uh, and Daniele uh, is, uh, is is our um, uh, region lead for Asia, uh, covering all system engineering activities. Uh, Daniele has covered a, a broad uh, broad number of uh, areas in train control and signalling in uh, Asia and Southeast Asia, and uh, he'll be able to give us his insights as well in what's been happening uh, closer to uh, Australia and New Zealand. And finally, uh, Michael Grigorovich. Uh, welcome, Michael. 
Uh, Michael's got over 15 years of experience in uh, innovation and new mobility services. Uh, Michael's worked uh, extensively uh, in research and development in the automotive field and worked on, on some of those latest automotive vehicle uh, topics uh, from the automotive. And I guess what we'll try and do uh, in this session today is look at the parallels between the automotive industry and the rail industry as well. So thank you for joining us uh, panel of experts. So the agenda today, just to uh, to kick off, will be uh, a 60 minutes together. Uh, we'll try and uh, endeavour to uh, uh, to cover that uh, that very packed agenda. Um, I guess first things first, we'll make sure that we cover uh, the global trends and key challenges, and uh, that's that's set the context and the scene behind the the modernisation of train control systems. Um, we'll then have a, a, a thorough discussion about two key themes that we believe are very important to raise when uh, when when train control uh, upgrades uh, come to mind. The first topic. Uh, how do we manage interoperability between systems, and uh, particularly as we go into the future? Uh, we'll talk about uh, the the reasons for looking at interoperable systems within train control, and we'll talk at a look at also the challenges in uh, making system talk, and and also uh, the different type of um, con context to interoperability. Then we'll move into uh, the importance of setting yourself up to deliver the project projects, the uh, train control upgrade projects in a successful manner and will be a, a key part of that will be how we discuss the importance of uh, the migration plan and some of the migration strategies uh, that we uh, within Sistra have uh, have developed over the years throughout our experience. Daniele will touch on some of the lessons learned that come through the interoperability and the modernization of the train control system, as well as the uh, the migration process. And then we will uh, we will converge into a uh, panel discussion where we'll talk about uh, the, converges, the converging towards autonom autonomous technology uh, and whether there's any parallels that we can draw from uh, the automotive industry and the rail industry and what does it look like in the future. Uh, that'll be followed by a, a session of Q&A. What we do want to do is uh, and probably take some of those questions as early as possible. If we can squeeze a few questions in uh, prior to the panel discussion that are most relevant to the uh, the first two topics of this webinar. So thank you so much for joining us again. Maybe a little bit about Sistra. Uh, so uh, I lead the advisory uh, business for Australia and New Zealand. Um, uh, a little bit globally about the company. So we're about seven and a half thousand employees across, across the uh, globe. Uh, we're uh, located in around 11 different countries, um, very system focused uh, and uh, and obviously a, a strong presence uh, in Australia and New Zealand. We're about 150 employees, uh, as, as you may be aware. Uh, we operate off uh, a very strong connection uh, of, uh, of teams uh, across the world and some of those capabilities that uh, that we'll discuss in uh, this webinar today. Uh, we have uh, we have a, a broad center of capability that we uh, that we have access to um, and and definitely I guess in the Australia New Zealand and Asia uh, uh, region, we're able to to bring best practice to the table. We can leverage some of the uh, signature projects uh, we're involved with around the world and, and quickly access uh, some of those uh, lessons learned for clients here. Um, in terms of innovation, we're very focused on uh, the emerging trends within the market, uh, understanding where technology is going, uh, how efficiencies are coming with technology upgrades, and certainly uh, that will come through in some of the themes that we cover in the webinar today. So I think just to set the scene a little bit um, around uh, what we see today uh, across the globe in terms of uh, the reasons for modernizing railways and train control systems. Um, some of these systems are amongst the most complex systems uh, and 
uh, I think what we can say is we reasonably expect them to uh, to get to have an, a, a close impact on uh, business transformation and business at the core of our clients. Um, we also talk about migrating system because uh, migration of, of system practices uh, for operators and asset owners is is essential to their their BAU capability. So some of the, some of the challenge here uh, that we've seen uh, globally in the market is the need for uh, urban networks uh, have seen pre-COVID patronage figures grow double digits uh, over the last decades, uh, urging more capacity on uh, some of the urban rail networks, uh, hence the need for improving rail capacity existing networks. Some of the other drivers include uh, stronger imperatives for rail operators to better anticipate and recover networks should they fail during operation. And so the need for uh, improved resilience and, and, uh, and reducing disruption of networks is becoming more and more important and paramount for, for our clients. Uh, the need to in, in improve reliability and on-time running. We've seen networks uh, required to be more and more reliable despite the increased complexity uh, of some of the assets. Uh, the productivity uh, of, uh, of the railways is, is always very important. Uh, automation uh, is, it may support productivity uh, and, and for sure managing uh, train control and supervision, whether we talk about below rail and above rail assets uh, is something to note. Uh, improving customer information and timetable planning uh, we've seen uh, making real-time changes to uh, customer information, uh, allowing uh, operators to adapt uh, to customer information change and reduce time uh, to test and deploy timetables uh, are, are some of the relevant topics in the market. Uh, managing aging assets and obsolescence. Uh, so in the era of digitalization, being able to fix some assets while keeping others available, obviously very critical uh, to uh, asset owners and operators. And ever present uh, push to keep uh, making those improvements also to safety and managing the safety of assets and being able to, uh, to limit the downtime windows for asset maintenance is also uh, very, very important. So just on the Australian New Zealand landscape, what we've seen in the past is uh, strong uh, strong pro uh, movements into investments in uh, digital transformation projects, uh, whether they be run uh, in Australia at federal level. Uh, we're understanding obviously uh, many investments uh, within LANREL and ATMS. Uh, many investment on the uh, east, eastern seaboard uh, in the last 10 years. We've seen a, a strong growth uh, with the, through the, throughout the states of Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. Some strong investments in even South Australia and obviously uh, a lot of, uh, of work coming up in Western Australia. Further afield uh, across the Tasman, New Zealand has also heavily invested into uh, train control upgrades and very, very much looking to pursue that investment cycle in the next 10 years. So a lot of things to uh, think about. Uh, maybe uh, a little bit uh, a context uh, towards the, the next subject of interoperability. So interoperability is defined as the capability to operate uh, on any stretch of the rail network without impacting uh, operating rules or principles. Uh, in, in other words, the focus is on making different technical systems of a railway work together uh, under the same operating principles. So uh, there's various ways to achieve interoperability. Uh, and I guess uh, I'll be handing over now to uh, Pierre-Henri, PH, uh, uh, to discuss a little bit more about the, the dilemma and the challenges uh, of interoperability. Thanks for joining us, PH. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for this introduction and hi, everybody. Thanks for joining the, the, the webinar. So I'll take you through the interoperability section today. Up to now, uh, we have been managing interoperability, as Adam explained, in ANZ and many countries around the world by not having signaling equipment on the train and relying on humans uh, reading and interpreting signal aspects or return orders to safely uh, operate the trains. Tomorrow, with the digitalization of the train control function, which will require safety critical equipment to be installed on the train, uh, we will need 
technical means to exchange information between infrastructure and running stock. Uh, we will no longer be able to only rely on humans uh, unless we resign ourselves to retain signals, written orders, or somehow find a way to segregate traffic. Right. Um, many jurisdictions uh, around the world have a, asked this, have gone through the same question over the past 20 years, and you can see some example of them on, on, on this uh, slide. And this is the case for you know, uh, metro, some metro networks, like it is a case in Paris and uh, New York. It also has happened on some uh, suburban lines. A, or high density lines that it would be the case in a London. Crossrail is an example of that. Paris suburban line, next to your project is another example. Um, a, also have managed interoperability at country or continent level. And I mean, some of the well known examples would be RTMS in Europe, but CTCS in China is another example of positive train control in the US. Um, none of them have uh, sought interoperability just for the beauty of it, uh, but they have rather on that to respond to different uh, strategic drivers, and which are mostly related to the open nature of the networks and the multiple operating companies uh, operating on them ensuring that there is a, you know, a robust supply chain which can deliver a, the, the, the investment that they forecast in the future. And that is the case, for example, for Metro in New York and Paris, or ensuring uh, you know, multiple suppliers will be available uh, to support future uh, competitive tenders. Okay. While I'm focusing on interoperability, it is worth uh, noting that a certain number of administrations around the world uh, have actually decided to deal with these issues without requiring a, a technical solution that delivers interoperability. As you can see on this slide, and I'll keep explaining, they are there's not a one size fit all solution for interoperability, and all these uh, organizations have actually adopted different uh, strategies to achieve interoperability. Some of them have uh, specified a, a single technology uh, and ensure that it is uh, supported by multiple suppliers. Okay. Commonly known examples would be RTMS in Europe, but CTCS in China, positive trend control in the US, and this is also what is a happening and be, is being sought by a Paris and New York metros, where they are developing or have developed a interoperable proprietary CBTC solution. We can also see that others have adopted slightly different techniques where they have a, decided to implement multiple train control a solution on the train, as many as they require to operate on the multiple networks of trains operate on. So PDC in the US have some initiatives that have a, relied on that techniques to achieve interoperability but also a uh, cross-rail projects and next in London and next to you in uh, suburban network in Paris rely on that. Alternatively, uh, others have a uh, uh, network managers have decided to install a multiple train control technology on the infrastructure to cater for all the different type of uh, technologies installed on the train. This is once again the case for some of the uh, PTC initiatives uh, in the US, but it is also the case uh, in many instances of high-speed line in Europe, where despite having installed uh, ERTMS as a primary solution, they have kept national uh, train control solution. An example of that can be found in, in high-speed line in France or uh, Spain. Interoperability um, uh, nowadays uh, is supported by uh, multiple technologies uh, that are offered by multiple suppliers. 
Okay, if this is the path that you have chosen. Okay, what? Uh, but if not, uh, there is uh, managing interoperability is not new, and there is already a vast body of knowledge and experience in the industry uh, to help you deliver an interoperable outcome. Uh, so far, and depending on the on the path that you're choosing, experience has shown that it is possible uh, by uh, adopting interoperable solution to reduce number of assets, uh, minimize dependency on, on suppliers, and, and improve a competitiveness during future procurement and avoid a vendor lock-in. On the other hand, interoperability comes at a cost and, and increases the initial uh, project delivery risks. Uh, those risks are already high due to the transformational aspects of uh, modernizing a train control system as well as the vital and operational critical nature of them. Those uh, costs, as we can see, are generally spent uh, upfront, while direct benefits of interoperability may only be realized in the long term. For example, if you are future-proofing a uh, procurement. These trade-offs between short and, and long-term objectives will require constant supervision uh, and effort during initial delivery of the project. In examples where interoperability needs to be achieved for, for assets belonging to different organizations, uh, we can also see that some of those costs can be spent by some organization, while others will, be, will reap the benefits of interoperability. So we've seen that this can lead to complex decision making, uh, which can uh, have a negative impact on the project delivery timeframes. Unfortunately, nowadays, uh, interoperability is a genuine issue for many networks and is no longer an option. Okay. However, based on our experience on you know, early ETCS implementation schemes in Europe, uh, in Australia, work we're doing in New York City and some of our contribution on the PTC rollout in the US, we are confident that interoperability can be achieved by organizations which are prepared to do so. The complexity of such tasks uh, requires to implement contemporary systems engineering techniques, uh, which have long been discussed in the past years in Australia and New Zealand, and I won't dwell too much on them. But I'll stress the need for robust and flexible configuration and change management processes. Those will have to be complemented by a robust and detailed testing, which we suggest happens as early as, as possible, starting in a lab, on a test track, and, and as early as from prototyping phases or first of class, and then subsequent phases of the project delivery. Applying processes will help, but it's not enough. You will need the right skill sets and experience to efficiently deliver uh, interoperability. And this is particularly true we're seeing on initial projects. Uh, once in business as usual, you will have time to grow up these skill sets. As uh, evidence too often on those interoperability projects, it cannot be taken for granted and it will be a continuous effort so we strongly recommend you recommend you prepare yourself to solve problems uh, irrespective of the technology or the supplier you have chosen to deliver your solution and if your version of interoperability is to work for multiple operators over multiple networks and supported by multiple suppliers uh, we strongly encourage you to define and agree a clear governance uh, structure amongst your deciding parties. This has to happen well ahead of having to make the critical and hard decision that you will inevitably have to make uh, during the initial phases. And lastly, 
uh, managing interoperability will be required all along the design life of your systems and not only during its initial delivery. So it is actually worth investing in a robust framework. Uh, you will need it when introducing new suppliers, expanding onto new areas, of, of network, introducing new rolling stock, or when managing obsolescence in the future. Nowadays, in addition to the increasing need for interoperability, the deployments of these modern train control systems are more and more required over dense networks where operations cannot be slowed down during project delivery. So I will hand over to Virginie, who will now explain us how to successfully migrate your existing solution to a new train control system in such environment. Over to you, Thanks, Virginia. thanks, thanks, thanks. BH. I'll, I'll, I'll just take over just quickly, just to remind uh, our listeners, and thanks uh, many of you for joining us. Please use the, you know, I'm the moderator, please use the chat to lodge your, your questions. Uh, don't be shy, you can lodge anonymous questions in the chat. We'd really appreciate to be in a position where our experts and ourselves can interact with you at the end of this uh, this presentation to make it as interactive as possible. Thank you, uh, PH, and I'll, I'll just hand over to Virginie. Sorry for buddy. Sorry for buddying, buddying in Virginie. No, thanks, thanks, Alain. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, or good morning, because that's uh, pretty early for me in Paris right now. Uh, so let's talk about migration. And easy transition, so that's never too early to start migration. Uh, because at first, uh, the change is inevitable. And uh, the time frame uh, for, for evolution is even uh, accelerating. Um, we are seeing it in our daily life, and it's also coming within the railway industry. Uh, sure, that's not the same pace as the, the new iPhone released, but still, <laughs> it's accelerating. And uh, we are putting computer within our uh, signaling control system. It's bringing uh, huge benefits, but at the same time, uh, it's shortening the life cycle. Uh, migration, which is just changing from one state to another one, uh, is no more an option. And uh, we've got more and more lines, existing lines and network that lead to brownfield projects. Uh, but even with, uh, with greenfield projects, uh, you can put your project in stages with several in service. Uh, and that's introducing some kind of level of migration. Uh, so let's face all the migration issues. Uh, the earliest possible, and uh, this way um, we it will be better uh, not to endure it and to secure it. Uh, to secure this uh, this migration process, uh, we've developed at Sistra uh, uh, a specific method for uh, our migration project. And this method is called uh, TOP, the TOP method. I like the name. It's uh, coming from one of my colleagues. Uh, it's always good in uh, finding uh, some catchy, uh, catchy name that stick in your mind. So this method is uh, to lay out all your options uh, so that you can find the best way to go. And then you monitor it and you are flexible enough that uh, any issue that may arise, you will be able to, to mitigate and to adapt. This method is in three steps. Uh, three steps. The first one is a uh, high level, uh, high level step. You are defining your top target, origin, and path. Uh, so with this, you have your high level uh, migration strategy. Then you go to the second step. Second step is um, once you've got those high level migration uh, requirements, you need to uh, uh, refine them uh, within all the layers of your project, uh, starting from the functional part and down to the, to the technical uh, part. And we can see 
it's easily applicable uh, in a procurement phase uh, because with this process, then at the end you have your procurement documentation. Uh, but that's also applicable in construction phase. Your supplier is delivering their, uh, their design uh, for review and you need to make sure that in their uh, requirements, uh, it's uh, complying with, with all your uh, migration, uh, high level migration requirements. And then the last step is uh, the interfaces. By doing the first two steps, you, are, uh, you highlight uh, the, the trick interfaces uh, so that you know exactly where to put your focus on uh, during the project. And let's now just have a, a deeper look uh, within the, the first step, uh, defining your top, which is the core uh, part of, uh, of this method. Uh, first, you've got your target. Target, you need to know exactly your project drivers. Uh, you need to uh, know your opportunities, your risks, and you need to define uh, uh, specifically your targeted uh, performances. Uh, then you, uh, you have your origin. Uh, you need to know exactly what the current status of your, uh, of your existing system. Uh, and for that, you also need to know exactly the availability and reliability of your documentation. And I, I remember um, I was working on Mexico Line 1, uh, modernization of the line and with high level migration strategy. And we, we realized that um, uh, most of the original documentation uh, was lost during the earthquake in, uh, in 1985. So that's something you need to know uh, to factor within your migration uh, strategy. And then, uh, so you've got your origin, uh, you need to go to your target, you have all the paths uh, in between, and uh, multiple paths depending on, on your priorities. Uh, but also on your constraints, uh, either it can be technical constraints, can be also uh, financial constraints or contractual ones and so on. Uh, so with this method, you have a complete view of all your options. Then uh, to, to define target, origin, etc., uh, we are using a um, collaborative workshop with all the stakeholders, but uh, in particular with operators and maintainers, because they are the one at the core of the system, they know everything. And um, just, yes, one example is, um, so I was uh, arriving at New York uh, uh, and I started working on the QBL project, uh, Queens Boulevard Line project, just to give you a rough idea that, um, uh, modernization uh, of an existing line. We are the lead consultant. And uh, so you've got 10 route miles with four tracks, around 10 interlockings and uh, 309 uh, train units to be equipped. So that's a pretty big, uh, big project. And I was talking with, uh, I was in charge at first of the training and maintenance. I was talking with the operator, operator and um, uh, trying to know how they were doing the, the training for their train operators, their drivers. Uh, so it was a five day uh, training, half classroom, half on site, uh, stopping operation uh, in a train with the trainees uh, to do their, their training. Um, I quickly realized that with more than 1,000 uh, train operator to be trained and the specific constraint of uh, having to go to operate on the line within one month after the training, it was not possible to, to keep on going like that. Uh, as we addressed this issue uh, soon enough, we were able to, to, to build a specific project within the migration project uh, to have uh, si driving simulators. Uh, and uh, and that's uh, I mean that's uh, uh, that was um, 
really changing, you know, from a, a constraint to a new opportunity because uh, we make huge saving uh, without uh, the need for uh, stopping operation. Uh, and it was also an investment for NYCT because as it's an interoperable CBTC, it was not only uh, investing in uh, driving simulators for QBL, but also for all the following uh, projects uh, that were coming. Uh, and uh, so good, uh, good change in, uh, uh, from constraint to opportunity. Uh, it's also open, uh, this method is also open to innovation. And uh, I've got another example about this is um, a steel QBL project. Um, we, you know, when you need to, to have the data collection, uh, at some point to feed your uh, signaling database. Uh, you go on site, stop operation with a cart, and you push it. I mean, that's uh, very expensive, very long, I, I guess. In, in, in the project, QBL project, it was 84 nights to do uh, all, the, all the lines, uh, and that's not, not flexible. Uh, and we uh, we thought that uh, in, in New York City they are uh, using uh, uh, specific tool trains with a lot of accurate uh, captors uh, to do some preventive maintenance to go on the line. And we thought, okay, let's try to use it uh, so that it can go uh, in between uh, revenue trains, so that's uh, uh, seamless for operation. Uh, and you can do your data collection and then process it, you know, after uh, do the post analysis. Uh, so we launch a proof of concept, another, uh, another project within the migration project with the suppliers, CBT suppliers, the supplier of the tool train, the operator, maintainer, and, um, uh, and the safety people, yeah, obviously. Uh, so it's ongoing and if uh, it's applicable, uh, it's it's going to be bring huge benefits uh, for everybody. Uh, then the method is independent from supplier. You need to to keep the competition alive, and finally it's scalable. As I said, it's uh, applicable from high uh, high level, uh, top level, the, uh, down to the technical part, uh, every uh, phase of your project. So that's it for the top method. And uh, now I'm going to leave the floor to Daniele. Uh, he's going to wrap it up all the lessons learned from uh, interoperability and migration. Uh, and uh, that's a pretty big challenge. Uh, Daniele, that's uh, up to you. Thank you very much, Virginie. Uh, I would like to summarize uh, what Virginie and Pierre Henry have presented with few lessons learned and recommendations. First of all, interoperability and migration should be at the heart of your thinking from the earliest phases. It is the case of Mumbai MRVC Capacity Enhancement Project in India, a complex network investment program with both interoperability and migration challenges. That means a moving block system deployed in an open, in an open network with both commuter and mainline trains with crossing levels, so uh, a big challenge. And we are supporting our customer MRBC on those topics from the feasibility studies, defining migration strategy that could be by section with a pilot line approach, etc., and how to handle existing mainline trains not meant for a moving block system. To master these kind of challenges, you need to consider both migration and interoperability as projects within the project. In Marseille Line 1 and Line 2 capacity enhancement project in France, the migration phase is divided in five steps for seven year duration, where trains continue to transport public passengers. That means 77 million per year, and it is a project in itself. And to carry out that, you need right competencies for both migration and interoperability. Competencies and expertise used to deal with these non-recurrent programs from owners and operators, and able to bring 
the return of experiences and benchmarks from overseas projects. And then the most uh, sensitive question. What is the best trade-off between having a simple Ferrari super fast car or having a custom Ferrari super fast based on your own design? So, sorry for Ferrari brand, but uh, I am Italian. And my answer is, it depends. If we talk about migration, please go for a tailored strategy. You will need specific solutions to interface your legacy system with the new one. For example, the day night switch over allowing day operation and test at night. It is specific and it shall be tailored to your legacy architecture and equipment. If we talk about new products, it should be driven by a cost benefit approach. You know, a, a new Ferrari super fast, having your custom brake pedal will not change your journey and nobody will notice. Instead of having performances that fit your needs, are proven in the market. It is the, the perfect deal. So Virginie and Pierre Henry have already explained that strong governance is a must. It allows to be effective on decisions, reaching project objectives on time and without overcost. It should be paired with the engagement of the stakeholder. I'm thinking about operator and maintainer. In Santiago Line 1, signaling renewal in Chile, operation and maintenance organization had strongly contributed to the new CBDC system for the revenue services and also during the migration phase. We don't have to forget that they must operate and maintain the system during the transition period and without disruptions. They were involved from the earliest phases of the project collecting their precious advices, and at the same time, we supported them on their business change process. That means new roles, tailored organizations, and a lot of training sessions before dynamic tests. The result was several three-month periods of night testing, with only three mornings of start of commercial service delayed, and the service revenue started as planned. But governance and organization should not be alone. They must be supported by processes. System engineering processes should be powerful and not only dedicated to the technical part. They should strongly support also contractual, planning and financial topic. One more example. We, we are involved in an LRT project in Asia and our customer during the tender design phase decided to change their mind from a fixed block signaling system to a moving block solution. And, you know, it is a huge modification considering that we were well advanced in the project phases. But thanks to the system engineering processes previously deployed, we have promptly identified the impacts and modified all documents without impact impacting planning and cost. All those points are very important and will help you to handle with unexpected events to ensure a smooth rollout of your project. But I would like to highlight one last point. If you are deploying a new technology system, interoperable or not, to enhance your performances, please think also about the future. In 20, 30 years, you will probably cope with the same challenges. So please think about solutions and architectures that could be easily and smoothly upgraded in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Daniele. Thank you very much. Very interesting insights around some of those lessons learned, certainly with those uh, those examples that you mentioned. Um, I guess uh, just looking at some of the questions coming through uh, from uh, the moderation uh, that we're looking at, uh, not many questions at this stage. We're hoping you can uh, come up with a few more questions. What I'd uh, suggest to do, uh, team, is uh, maybe we cover the uh, the next panel discussion. So I'd like to move to the, the next topic, which was 
Uh, I guess with the context of all we're seeing at the moment uh, around autom autonomous technology and the maturity uh, and some of the programs that have been launched in the last five years around enhancements and development of autonomous technologies, how do those relate with uh, the uh, state of the field in terms of uh, upgrading uh, train control automatic systems? Uh, so maybe let's start with a few questions uh, to Michael. Uh, thanks for joining us, Michael. Uh, I guess we'd like to ask a few questions around the autonomous train industry and uh, some of the initiatives that are that are being launched uh, in recent time. Uh, how is rail different to road, first of all, and where uh, the topic of autonomous vehicle is getting a lot of attention uh, with promises it is coming uh, to customers very soon? How do you see, see developments in that area and, uh, and what's your state uh, of, of analysis there, Michael? Yeah, th thanks, Alan. There's a, there's a couple of uh, interesting questions there. So, I mean, certainly there are several autonomous train initiatives happening around the world right now um, in France, Germany, Russia, China and the US. Uh, even here in Australia, we, we have driverless systems already up with, you know, such as Rio Tinto's Auto Hall and, and Sydney Metro. But for full autonomy, you know, I think what we're typically seeing is target date somewhere for revenue first revenue services around about 2025. Uh, but from a technology standpoint, um, you're right. I mean, the approach being taken with these initiatives I mentioned has much in common with what we're seeing already piloted for autonomous road vehicles, such as cameras, radar and, and LIDAR, but of course adapting and, and augmenting them to a railway context. Uh, now, when we look at road versus rail, it's, it's certainly true that the number of scenarios an autonomous road vehicle could encounter will be far greater than that of an autonomous train. So, you know, on the surface, one could easily be mistaken for thinking that an autonomous train should be easy, right? But actually, there, there's one very big difference between rail and road that makes autonomous trains still a very real technical challenge, and that's stopping distance. So, for example, if a road vehicle is traveling at, say, 100 kilometers an hour, uh, and an autonomous driving system detects an event that requires emergency braking, then depending on the vehicle, it may achieve a braking distance in the region of say 50 meters. In the case of a train, that braking distance at the same speed could be anywhere from 150 meters for light rail to a few hundred meters for a modern passenger train to you know, up to one and a half kilometers for a big freight train. So this big increase in stopping distance means that any train-based object and environment detection system is going to need a much greater resolution and detection range to be feasible. Um, Additionally, I mean, in Australia, New Zealand, and many other countries, uh, railways are not also are also not um, subject to the same safety laws and approval processes as road vehicles. So, even at a bare minimum, these technologies I'm talking about for the road need to be completely reassessed and revalidated for a railway context. Um, I guess the last point I'd make is this: there's one more key difference between autonomy for the road and rail, and we can we can see that by asking ourselves, well, why is autonomy being pursued? So in the case of road vehicles, it's not just about removing the driver for safety and convenience, but there's also a, a greater objective about it, improving the efficiency of the overall road network through improved traffic coordination and, and reduced vehicle spacing. However, in the case of rail, the picture is a bit different. So these initiatives in rail I mentioned, you know, they're typically focusing their efforts in substituting driving responsibilities by these onboard systems. Uh, and, and that's what delivers these new capabilities to, to read science, signals and signs, to detect obstructions within the structure gauge, you know, to, to, to manage the degraded and emergency situations. Uh, but despite these additional capabilities, an autonomous train will not necessarily improve other key performance metrics such as speed or headway, because those are still going to be limited by the underlying infrastructure and in particular the signaling. Thanks, Michael. So I guess building on that, I'd like to move now to a question for Virginie. Uh, so Virginie, I guess, uh, given what Michael's just told us, if these autonomous train initiatives don't support necessarily better headways, how do automatic uh, grade of automation two, three or four products, for instance, manage the removal of the driver while minimising spacing between trains? Mm, yeah, thanks, uh, Alan, for this question. Uh, yes, you're right. I mean, within the metro uh, industry, uh, we've got uh, products, uh, existing products, uh, such as CBTC, 
uh, where you can be driverless and uh, improve uh, your headway, uh, reduce the spacing between trains. Um, I think, I mean, this type of technology, you have um, you have intelligence on board, you have also intelligence on the track side. Uh, one of the, I mean, the first thing is that you, you've got a closed network. Uh, so you, you, you've got control uh, over your tracks. Uh, you're using, um, uh, I mean, specific track side equipment. Uh, to be sure that you have no intrusion on the tracks and that's a way of uh, being uh, uh, driverless. Uh, you can use very efficient uh, platform screen doors, but that's very expensive too. And then you've got uh, uh, also uh, specific um, captors, uh, detectors uh, you put on the, tr on the track side uh, to control your intrusion. Uh, that uh, with this and uh, I mean the the support of strong uh, safety uh, process, you can remove the the driver, and with all the intelligence, knowing all the trains where they are and the uh, trackside intelligence, you can uh, bring the the train together, and be uh, much more efficient. But um, I think you cannot. I mean, just take this product, this type of metro product, and apply it on the railway uh, environment because first it's an open uh, environment, so that's pretty different. You need to adapt, and uh, and then the scale. I mean, just the scale. Uh, it's uh, very expensive to uh, uh, all the detectors uh, to put it on uh, the the this laid uh, larger scale. Uh, the trade-off between, you know, the cost uh, and uh, the, uh, I mean, the the benefit it's bringing, uh, it might not be worth it, and that might be uh, why you cannot just, you know, you need to adapt uh, the solution. Thanks, Virginie. So, con considering what you've just said, maybe I'll, I'll direct a couple of questions to Daniele. Uh, Daniele, there, there looks to be some functional overlap between automatic and autonomous train control systems. First question, how do you see this technology transitioning at, or the transition taking place, particularly for suburban and long distance network operations? And then secondly, uh, what does that mean for transport agencies planning future rail networks? Thank you very much, uh, Alain. Thank you for your question. That are very interesting points. Uh, as we have seen by, from uh, Michael and Virginie, uh, autonomous trains are developing technology to perform the task currently performed by train drivers without new equipment on the wayside. All the new components are located uh, on the train. This could be advantageous from a financial point of view compared to digital uh, train control systems, but will not increase notably the performances of your network. For example, the headway, the number of trains per hour, etc. As per the automotive return of experience, I don't expect having autonomous trains replacing at a stroke the automated solutions. It will be probably a step by step process introducing gradually new functionalities. That means having uh, autonomous and automated technologies converging to hybrid architectures that take pros of each solution. That means higher performances with limited investments in terms of infrastructure. Thanks, Daniele. Um, thanks. That, that was sort of the, the some of the, our panel discussions. Now, I guess I'd like to move to uh, the moderation box and to take uh, some of our Q&A uh, uh, to move to the Q&A uh, panel session. Um, I guess looking at some of the questions, a few more questions uh, being asked now. Uh, so that's great to see some questions uh, come through there. Uh, perhaps uh, we'll get the first one here. Uh, so I'll go through the, the, the uh, question here. Maybe I'd like to direct to uh, PH. PH. Um, 
uh, one of the questions that's come through, keen to hear the panel's thought and experiences on modernizing train control beyond standard safe working, e.g. Uh, uh, so presumably FNLS, fine life safety rules in underground ventilation sections. PH, um, are you able to sort of maybe steer, uh, steer us towards an answer to that question? Yep, yep. Thank you for the question, Alan. Uh, look, that's an interesting that's an interesting question, and I think not preempting which project is is suffering these uh, these these issues is with introduction of modern train control system. You blurring the the limits of responsibilities between disciplines on the on the railways. And you now have a new opportunity to to best allocate functions to the technology that delivers the best outcome. In this particular case, it is quite a common approach in metro systems, you know, with a high proportion of underground operation, to use the signaling system or the train control system to ensure all requirements for separation of trains. Okay, a, one of them is commonly a, driven by your tunnel ventilation design. So it is a, it is a, it is a common approach, a, but it has some a downside effect that you know if you're preventing train from getting close, whether it's because of signaling concern or tunnel ventilation concern, eh, the overall performance of the railway, i.e. the headway, will be impacted. Thanks, PH. Um, a few more questions coming through. Actually, one specifically for you, PH, but we'll maybe leave one uh, to the side and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pick another one that's just come through. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just read it out. Do the emerging automotive intelligent transport technologies provide any opportunities for rail, for instance, um, improving level crossing safety? Um, so there's a question around how we might be able to leverage some of the te technologies uh, around autonomous or aut automotive intelligent transport technologies. Is that maybe one for you, Michael, or? Yeah, sh sure, Alan. Um, Look, I think the short answer is is yes. Um, I mean, if I if I tried to sort of narrow the answer a little bit more, I, I think where what we see a lot in in the automotive space is it's you, know, you can have as many sensors as you like, but that's but you need to have the un the, the intelligence to understand what the data is telling you. And so there's a lot going on in the artificial intelligence space to understand what what is what's happening in that scene. Is an object going to move? Which way is it moving? How fast is it moving? Etc. And so I think there's I think your answer is yes. There are applications you could use to, to you know, um, have a, an analytic system over a level crossing to say, well, what's what's happening in that environment around it? Um, you know, are there potential risks that need to be responded to, etc. But um, uh, it's definitely a, you know a fast moving field, and I expect yeah, there, will, there certainly will be lessons that can be transferred across. Thanks, Michael. Uh, before going back to one for PH, um, there's another question here about um, uh, quite interesting uh, to the panel. Is it possible that rail systems will ever become plug and play, much like home IT components? Um, uh, in your experience, maybe, Daniele? Uh, yeah, I guess yeah. I, I fear what the answer is, but uh, <laughs> maybe you can steer us uh, towards an answer there. Probably not like the Ferrari there. <laughs> no, <laughs> Ferrari is not uh, completely plug and play. <laughs> in, in any case, uh, the the answer is uh, yes, in the sense of there is more and more uh, IT part in the transportation systems. That means that through IT, through the digital, through uh, new functionalities, it will be more and more easily to configure and adapt uh, systems uh, for transportation. I'm not sure that it could be as buying an iPhone, arriving at home and just uh, put your iPhone uh, near the old one, transferring all the data. It could be, but it's not for the short term period. 
Yeah, thanks, Danielle. And I guess given having uh, myself worked in that industry uh, for those large uh, private organisation investing a lot in R&D, I guess there's different strategies that come into the mix as well in terms of which functional functionalities uh, suppliers are looking to uh, to explore and then obviously uh, c competition between the suppliers on, you know, being the first uh, to be positioned with specific functionalities. And I guess that sort of dilemma would probably also push to uh, maybe, you know, having uh, evolving roadmaps uh, throughout the development uh, of, of some of the uh, the new functionalities. So if that can help. Uh, just mindful of time, we've only got a, just under two minutes left in this webinar, but we've enjoyed some of the, the late questions coming in. We'll just maybe a final one for UPH. Um, does establishing technical interoperability between disparate systems simply create bigger problems in the future and when you need to do when when you need to change something so i guess that's maybe a, a bit of an interesting open question um well the so quick what, what's your, challenge your take i guess the quick answer is the quick answer is yes uh, <laughs> the introduction of his of his modern technology will bring lots of benefits more advanced function access to more data and more information that can be reused by the organization however uh, it will not make things uh, simpler and interoperability in particular is is about connecting or interconnecting system a creating a, a, a massive and possibly, you know, a significant system of systems where changes on one side cannot be made in isolation on, on, of what is happening on other part of the of of that overall ecosystem. So yes, it can it, it can do that. But on the other hand, it will deliver all the benefits that we have been discussing. As Virginie said, you know, a change in is, a, is inevitable. The pace at which change will happen is a, is going to increase. So this is not only about the technology you choose; it's about adapting and preparing yourself to all these changes. And just to add, I mean, uh, on my example of the driving simulators, uh, once you've got interoperability, then it's easier because it's applicable to all your lines. So you can, I mean, change the, the training process for uh, pretty easily uh, at the end. Yeah, thanks, Virginie. And thanks. I think that sort of uh, will unfortunately have to close the session very shortly. Just uh, maybe some last piece of information. Uh, we did uh, in, end up receiving a lot more questions towards the end, uh, and and we apologise for not being able to cover all those questions right now. But we'll endeavour to get back to you and answer you those questions. If you have posted your details, uh, get back to you with some of those answers. Also, we'll be sharing some of the materials uh, on our website. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, our details are uh, on the screen right now. Just feel free to uh, drop us a line. Uh, maybe just in concluding, uh, first of all, uh, maybe a, a word of conclusion. We're seeing, you know, more and more train control upgrades uh, are not just about uh, having modern train control systems uh, impacting resignaling. They, they go beyond, uh, you know, staging the construction of a project uh, and, and well into uh, impacting businesses uh, and the businesses that are running the railways are at the forefront of uh, the uh, positioning of migration plans and the key questions around interoperability. Uh, and so uh, that's likely to uh, to be at the forefront uh, whenever you're looking at upgrading train control systems. So please join me in uh, thanking uh, the participants today. Uh, Virginie, thanks for joining Thank from, from Paris. Daniele, thanks for joining from, uh, from Asia. Uh, and uh, close to home, uh, PH and um, uh, and uh, Michael, thank you very much indeed for joining us from the comfort of your home in lockdown mode. So uh, thank you very much. We hope you've enjoyed the session and uh, we look forward to engaging with you uh, very soon into the future. Thank you. Thanks for me.